So this time temperature turbulence basic, um, uh, you know, fundamentals, you know, is, is important to keep in mind. Um, uh, you know, the time we've kind of talked to, um, uh, the correct balance of time and mixing will achieve complete combustion, uh, minim minimize flame impingement. So if we have too much time that we can get an elongated flame that's going to, uh, you know, kind of not be controlled within the area, the combustion area that we want in the, in the firebox. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the turbulence is that mixing energy to make sure that our air and fuel is being um, introduced, uh, you know, appropriately that, you know, the oxygen is there at the time that we need it to enhance the combustion. Um, and obviously the temperature control, you know, we want to make sure we're controlling our process to, so that we're extracting temperature and controlling that uh, temperature inside the uh, firebox to uh, make sure we're supporting combustion but not over, you know, over uh, getting too much temperature in the unit. Um, so the basics, um, as you kind of remember, uh, from high school chemistry or college chemistry, but the um, uh, you know the different fuels that we that we heat, um, you know, all kind of have the same basic chemical reaction. Um, but yeah, so we kind of covered this already. But the carbon dioxide and water is the end products that we're trying to drive through, and we'll talk about incomplete combustion and what what we get to uh, further on. But when we're talking about natural gas and um, uh, refinery gas, those more simple hydrocarbon compounds makes a much more efficient transfer to, uh, to the energy and heat that we're looking for. When we start to get into complex fuels where we've got either liquids or longer chain carbons, there may be other impurities, nitrogens and other uh, sulfonated compounds in here. Um, those all kind of interact in this process as well. Um, uh, you know, and, and either can drive inefficiency or, or pollutants uh, that, of, that we want to minimize. Um, all right, so uh, by monitoring and regulating uh, some of the gases in the stack or the exhaust, it's easy to improve the combustion efficiency uh, and, and conserves fuel and lowers expenses. So the monitoring that we talked about in the energy assessment and that we'll talk about uh, more in the boiler tune-up is monitoring that chemical reaction and seeing how uh, our boiler is set up and what performance we're getting out of the combustion scenario that's set up. Um, and the combustion efficiency is the calculation of how effectively the combustion process runs. You know, how are we converting our fuel to required energy that we need? And so when we talk about efficiency in a energy assessment or a uh, energy system, there's a couple of different components. You know, the combustion efficiency is specifically, you know, how efficient are we at converting the energy and the fuel to usable energy that, um, uh, you know, for, for our process. Um, you know, so how, you know, are we getting unburned carbon out of that? Or are we generating too much CO? Um, you know, that, that's the combustion efficiency, and then you get into the overall system where efficiency where how do we transfer that heat into the usable mediums that we want. Um, and so that's a whole other efficiency equation in the process. Um, so complete combustion occurs when all of the energy in the fuel is being burned to, and is extracted and none of the carbon and hydrogen compounds are left unburned. You know, this is the ideal or, you know, scenario in practice that's not necessarily achievable. Um, and the air to fuel ratio is very critical in achieving or getting close to the ideal condition of complete combustion. Um, so although the theoretical or stoichiometric combustion provides the perfect uh, fuel to air ratio, which thus lowers uh, losses and extracts all the energy from the fuel, in, in reality these conditions are unattainable. Um, due to all the you know, heat loss and other inefficiencies that are in the system. Um, in order to achieve complete combustion, it is necessary to increase the amounts of air to the combustion process to ensure burning all the fuel um, and the amount of air that must be added uh, to make the energy is, is achieved is known as excess air. So we've been talking about excess air and measuring O2 in the stack. Um, so in practice, what, you know, what, what happens in the firebox is that we're adding more air than what is required for that perfect combustion 
to ensure that we overcome the inefficiencies of the combustion process. So as we talked about, there's a certain ignition loss or inefficiency just in getting the fuel and igniting it into the, in the uh, burner itself. Um, we want to make sure we're providing enough air in the system so that, um, that we're uh, making sure there's enough uh, oxygen molecules to combust the, the fuel. Um, and as we say, the air, air to fuel ratio, as we start monitoring the stat gases and looking to use that data to analyze how, we're, how our process is doing, um, you know, we're looking for carbon monoxide, which is an incomplete conversion of the carbon uh, molecules to, instead of going to CO2, we don't have enough air in the system, we're getting more CO. And so that's an incomplete reaction. Um, we're going to generate SO2. Um, and NOx compounds as part of the process. We have fuel bound sulfur and nitrogen uh, uh, in, the, in the fuel and that's gonna drive uh, the generation of other compounds as we're uh, in the combustion process. Um, soot and ash are also indicators of um, you know, how the combustion performance is, is working. If we're getting char and carryover, you know, unburned particles, you know, that, that is an indicator that we're not you know, either getting the right temperature or turbulence in the combustion zone to complete that reaction, or we don't have enough air in the system to complete that uh, reaction. All right. Um, some of these slides are repetitive, so if you uh, bear, bear with me here, I'm trying to kind of get through a couple of these. Um, so complete combustion, as we said, we've kind of talked through that. Um, the stoichiometric combustion is that theoretical point um, yeah, for perfect efficiency. So we're trying, in our tuning and our efficiencies, we're trying to get to that perfect level. Uh, and our biggest tool that we have to do that is our air to fuel ratio. <coughs> so in most cases, the boiler temperature, turbulence, those kind of design parameters are fixed by the, um, the volume of the firebox, the, um, the arrangement of the burners, uh, you know, where the combustion air is coming in and how that blends. Those are all kind of inherent design components to the uh, burner or the, uh, the boiler. And usually the main tool that we have um, to make sure that we're uh, maximizing the efficiency is, is the adjustment of our air. And so the air to fuel ratio uh, becomes very important in, in you know, normal operations of the boiler. And we talk, you know, a lot of uh, units will have online monitoring for um, stack O2 or in some cases stack CO as well to kind of help give the operators some operational parameters and uh, real-time indication on how uh, a unit is performing. Um, when we do the uh, boiler tuning, you know, inspecting the flame pattern is one part of that boiler tune-up that, uh, that we're looking at. Um, and so by looking at the flame, you know, in general these long orangish flames is an indicator of um, you know, poor performance, you know, the air to fuel ratio is off, we're not getting uh, the most efficient combustion uh, you know, set up there. Um, as, the, as the boiler air is adjusted, we're able to find a sweet spot where we get that blue-green type of flame pattern and that's what you know, is ideal situation um, from a visual standpoint to kind of get a feel for you know, are we getting close to having a you know, more efficient um, combustion process. Um, so draft, so we're talking about our air to fuel ratio. So the air systems of the boiler or process heater become very important and how we're maintaining that pressure, how we're supplying air into the unit, um, you know, becomes one of those critical points uh, to, to understand on how to tune the, the system. Um, you know, all of these units are set up uh, with some sort, you know, depending on the design, uh, you know, we're supplying combustion air into the device. You know, in some cases that combustion air is a natural draft to where we're just using the heat of the reaction or the heat of the, um, uh, the furnace to have a chimney effect and draft, um, uh, you know, ambient air into the system for combustion. Um, you know, that works under certain situations for certain designs. There's not many boilers that are designed as a natural draft. Most boilers are forced draft uh, or uh, balanced draft type boilers where we're um, using a fan to enhance the 
uh, the pressure and the airflow through the system to make sure that we're uh, supplying the oxygen for the reaction. Um, See, so monitoring draft. So, so the draft system, as we start into our energy assessment and our boiler tune-up, really the, the energy assessment component, uh, the draft is very important. If we're set up and we have certain fans and we're trying to balance and have a certain pressure in the system, any place where we have tramp air that's coming into the process, air that's coming in where it's not intended or designed to be entering the system, um, it's, it can impact our fans' ability to supply the right pressure uh, to the unit. You know, we have to kind of overcompensate for that. So the tighter the, um, the air system is, the ductwork and, you know, the fan, you know, the more control that the operator has on turning that air to fuel ratio and getting the desired results from the system. Any, any inefficiencies in that where we're losing air in different places uh, in, in, can impact how that uh, boiler uh, operates. Yeah, it's much worse for a force draft boiler. So when you're designed for certain pressures and you need certain penetration into the firebox and certain pressure to, um, you know, to create that turbulence in the reaction, um, any sort of uh, inefficiencies in that area where you're not getting that directed or you're losing pressure before you get there. Um, you know, it impacts that ability to, uh, you know, and it's also tra tramp air um, and parts of that system where you're sucking in colder air from ambient air from outside uh, in, in the negative parts of the fan, you're starting to impact your efficiency of, you know, now you've, you know, you've, if you're trying to preheat air and have a hotter air going into the firebox and now you're sucking in colder outside air that hasn't been conditioned, you're dropping your efficiency at that point as well. So, you know, in a, in a modern, uh, you know, efficient boiler, you know, you have a lot of heat exchanger systems to economize both trying to heat the combustion air as hot as possible before entering the firebox so that, um, so that you're utilizing your waste stack gas. You're cooling that stack gas down with the incoming air to the unit um, to, in to increase that temperature. And then you're also trying to heat up the, uh, uh, the feed water so that the feed water that's going into the, the boiler system is as hot as possible and takes less energy to, um, you know, to raise the temperature to the desired steaming point. But um, yeah, so th the draft and leaks is, is mainly a problem when you've got fan systems in, uh, in place. Um, so for the draft, you know, a lot of the systems as well have monitoring. You know, most boilers have pressure on your fans. You have pressure in different components of the uh, uh, of the air delivery system, and also the the pressure at the exit to the uh, the firebox becomes a very uh, critical point as well. So usually about a half inch of water is a good uh, operating range uh, for uh, negative pressure at the end of exit of a firebox. Uh, you know, and so all those kind of uh, draft parts, and this is kind of where the engineering specifications in the uh, energy assessment come into play. Um, you kind of talk about how do you know what those operating ranges need to be. You know, a lot of that's set up in the original design. This is kind of where the fan's designed. This is where, you know, so if the fan's been replaced at some point and wasn't replaced with a like kind unit or had a little bit different static pressure characteristics, you know, that could affect things. So some of that history comes into play uh, when you're looking at an energy assessment as well. Um, all right. All right. So. Kind of this is the classic curve that um, you know, that you guys have probably have seen uh, with the relationship of you know as you supply more excess air into a system, um, you know you're driving down the products of incomplete combustion, your carbon uh, monoxide, and you know this this is fuel dependent. Um, different fuels require different amounts of excess air. You know different fuels are more inherently efficient, like we talked with natural gas. Um, you know, this re requires a lower excess air concentration when you're looking at coal or other solid fuels. Um, usually you have to run a higher excess air content. So this profile is somewhat system and fuel dependent, but in general the, re the relationship is the same. You know, the more excess air you're putting into the system, um, you're providing more chance to get to that uh, complete or stoichiometric combustion. You know, with zero kind of this being the point where you know, your airflow is ideal for the fuel input that you have. 
and then the, the additional air being needed to overcome those inefficiencies in the system. So in theory, the amount of excess air that you need for um, to, to drive your CO down and get a good combustion uh, profile is a good measure of how efficient your combustion process is. Um, all right. And the, you know, the excess air too, we talked about turbulence, but you know, you know, there is a, a point where you know, too much air in a system uh, is not good as well. So you're carrying out temperature. When you start putting too much air in a system, uh, you're impacting the flame uh, characteristics. You're carrying temperature out through the stack. Um, and you're, you're putting more velocity through uh, the unit. So um, especially in a boiler design, the more airflow velocity you have at certain parts in the unit, you start to get wear and tear on the internals. Uh, you start to wear your refractory. And you can um, have places where your tubes, your actual um, uh, boiler tubes start to get thin from abrasion and, and things like that. So you know, the air balance, just cranking up and putting too much air in the system is not a good thing. Um, so that it's important that we, that we try to find that balance point. All right, so the, the amount of excess air, the calculation, um, it's, it's a pretty straightforward. So as we measure uh, the amount of air in the stack um, or the exhaust leaving the combustion device, um, we just take you know, 20.9 being the ambient concentration minus the amount measured um, it was the total amount measured, and that gives you the percent excess air. So it's a pretty easy, straightforward calculation to kind of determine how much excess air you have. And as we said, that, that required amount is it's unit specific and it's fuel specific. Um, these are some typical examples of what would be a, a, you know, a, a range of excess air for the different fuel types. So you know, we're looking at some of these uh, pulverized coal where you actually make a finer powder and increase the efficiency of that heat or that reaction. It's, you know, 15 to 40 percent uh, excess air may be required. Um, when you've got uh, spreader stoker or other coal systems that aren't uh, as fine a, uh, uh, a powder, then it's a little bit more excess air is required. Uh, then as you start to get into the more refined fuels, fuel oil and natural gas, your requirements for excess air um, you know, drop considerably. So, you know, this kind of falls into, as we talked about the emission limits and in this max rule, um, these units are heavily regulated and have limits on how much particulate matter, uh, how much CO and, um, you know, other uh, contaminants are, are uh, because it, they're, you know, inherently less efficient. There's more carryover pollutants. Um, it's a more difficult process to manage. Or we've got natural gas and fuel oil these are much cleaner burning fuels and, and easier to uh, manage the combustion. Therefore, they're inherently lower polluting. Um, so anyhow, so yet yeah, managing the excess air is, is the biggest uh, thermal combustion efficiency impact. Um, and that's why the, you know, that's why the tune up is required once a year. I mean, that air flow and adjusting that ratio, it's, you know, once a year in the rule is coming back and calibrating and looking at this. Um, this relationship in the unit and, and making those adjustments uh, to improve the efficiency. Um, so this is kind of just another look with a couple of other different um, uh, considerations or, or uh, relationships on the graph. But you know, kind of same kind of same thing here. Where this is kind of the peak efficiency region. Region, as you can see, this is kind of where the CO2 peaks out, kind of in this relationship, um, and that's kind of the area where. Um, you know, where we're kind of looking for. The other components, as Neil had mentioned, that we're measuring in the stack. So we've got CO, you know, this is our big, uh, one big uh, indicator. Um, you know, so the CO level is not zero here, but it's, it's, you can see that relationship, it's driving down towards some much lower level approaching zero. And then our hydrocarbons or our unburned fuels, you know, having that additional analysis in the stack helps us to understand where we are in this relationship as well. And the, you know, in theory, we should be have that unburned fuel down to zero when we find that sweet spot as far as the the best spot for the air to air fuel ratio. And then you know that air adjustment is this oxygen content right here. And as we're uh, you know, so trying to find the sweet spot, there's you know we're measuring CO, the oxygen and hydrocarbons, and and looking at tuning to find that that uh, that low point there. Yeah. 
heard that. You increase NOx, yep. So there's a component. Yeah, so that's a great point. And as we kind of talked to that, so, and the rule, the way it, way it speaks as well, they, they understand that as you drive CO down, at some point you're driving NOx up. And so as you have limits for NOx um, and NOx requirements on your units, you know, that, that has to be maintained. And so when we do the tune-up, it's, it's not at the expense of, Knox. So we may actually not get down to this sweet spot if there's permit limits requiring the NOx to be at a certain level. So we may have to, uh, you know, operate a little bit less efficiency on the CO component in order to meet our NOx limits. Yep. Well, there's two, there's two components to NOx. NOx. A lot of NOx is about temperature. Um, there's a thermal component that you're not going to, you know, there's the fuel bound component that, um, it's going to be there no matter no matter what, and then there's the the thermal component where where you're converting nitrogen in the atmosphere into into um, to NOx. Yeah. Yeah, and that's you know that's one thing we're kind of missing on this graph is that NOx relationship, and that's in the stack. That's kind of what we're looking for is that NOx balance, um, you know, as well, and and. Uh, you know, finding that sweet spot where we're not, uh, you know, you know, exceeding any sort of NOx limits. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, all right, so then, uh, you know, as Neil has kind of mentioned already about our efficiency and, and, you know, the total heat losses over the heating value of the fuel is kind of how we're establishing and um, kind of working through that, that uh, estimation of our efficiency. Um, so combustion analysis, this is just kind of another graphical look at, uh, you know, but doesn't have the NOx component to it. We need to add that. Um, you know, as we get into this sweet spot of the stoichiometric um, air to fuel ratio, you know, over this area is kind of where we're um, driving for percent excess air, driving the oxygen up. Um, uh, you know, and the, and the CO down. Um, you know, prior to that, if we don't have enough oxygen, you know, our CO concentration is, is obviously going to be much higher. Um, you know, and this comes into play too. I, I don't know if you guys have, you know, base loaded or swing loaded units, but when we're looking at um, a, a boiler, typically would, you know, that may have more of an issue with being a swing load where the steam demand varies and you know the boiler uh, feed or the fuel input changes well that change um, drives uh, you know a change in the airflow so we we'll start putting less or more fuel in in a rapid uh, uh, manner and the boiler doesn't respond very very quickly so you know if, as you're trying to generate more steam in a process it takes time for that you know that additional steam demand to be satisfied so you throw fuel to it and the boiler kind of swings and tries to adjust and generate more heat to, to satisfy that heat load, um, you know, and your air can be kind of, your air uh, ratios can change uh, pretty dramatically in some cases. And, you know, usually for natural gas boilers, they respond pretty well. This is more uh, in a solid fuel boiler when you swing the loads, um, you know, you got to physically put a solid fuel in there. It takes a long time, it takes a while for that to burn, to, um, to release the heat, and so there's some lag time and how that whole system kind of operates. But generally, in a natural gas or a gaseous uh, fuel system, you know the response is a lot quicker and there's less lag in the boiler as far as generating the heat output. But um, you know that can be, depending on how your steam system set up, that can be a consideration in looking at um, the efficiencies. And you know some, you know there are ways to overcome that. You know boilers that have swing loads sometimes will have an extra steam accumulator that will kind of store. Um, energy and to be used and, and dampen the swings on the on the boiler, but um, all those swings can impact the airflow uh, of the system. What's that? Um, I'm not sure where what where these numbers came from. I'm not sure if that's wet or dry. I think it's dry. Excess air, excess air. 
flue gas percent by volume, dry gas. That's the flue gas volumes dry, yeah. Um, the, uh, the fire heater situation, um, you know, these are a couple of uh, cut sheets or uh, diagrams showing the typical arrangements on uh, some of the fire heaters. Uh, you can see a couple of different designs. Um, you know, we've got the uh, maybe multiple burners kind of helping spread out the, the temperature load in the bottom of the, of the unit. Um, that's maybe a little more efficient than a single burner in the middle where we've got some dead zones along the edge. Um, uh, you know, our heat, our upflow of the heat, you know, and we're getting that heat transfer into the radiant tubes that are going to transfer the material. So, you know, the more surface area of the tubes that we have in the system, you know, the more heat transfer that we're going to get in those situations. You know, managing airflow out of the unit, any place we've got a sharp um, connection like that, you generate dead, dead zones and, um, you, know, uh, you know, normal fluid dynamic kind of considerations are important in, in some of these you know, situations. These are places of potential high wear for that velocity impacts and those kind of things on refractories. Um, you know, so the, uh, uh, you know, the different designs can all affect the efficiency of the units. So I guess John has kind of a question here. So most fire heaters are bottom up fired configurations with tall and relatively narrow combustion chambers, um, fuel aside, since time, turbulence, and temperature are keys to optimal combustion, um, are these efficient configurations? So would you guys think that uh, from a time, turbulence, temperature standpoint that this is an, an efficient design? Well, that's kind of how they're designed. I would hope they're designed for efficiency, but uh, so Doug, you're kind of shaking your head. What, what do you see as far as the efficiency issues that stand out to you? Right. Yep. So yeah, that's a great point. So all this length right here is designed to keep that temperature and transfer the heat as much as possible and uh, before the convection section and then use the convection tubes to kind of further cool it out and rain, uh, get, it, get extra energy out of the system. So yeah, these, these are, um, you know, very efficient units, uh, you know, designed for efficiency and, um, you know, that turbulence and contact time, you know, is happening right here at the burner section and then, you know, it's a fairly laminar flow, a good heat transfer up through the unit. Um, all right, so yeah, these come in all shapes and sizes, can be up fired, wall fired, and even down draft. So, you know, depending on the service, there's a lot of different process heater um, uh, applications and configurations out there. And, you know, since there are, you know, many different configurations, it's important to go back to those engineering specifications or the design of the system to uh, conduct that energy assessment. So you're kind of truing up to what the intent of the design was uh, on how the current operation is. But, um, you know, a lot of different manufacturers out there. Uh, there's a, a few that uh, we encounter out in the field. Um, all right, so boiler and, and heater types. So the combustion process is driven to, um, you know, support some sort of beneficial function that we need, right? So we're trying to get the heat out of the unit. And in general, there's two different types of uh, heat transfer designs. Um, uh, there's fire tube boilers and water tube boilers. So uh, the fire tube boilers would be where the, um, the combustion gases are kind of in the center, center areas of the heat exchanger. And there's a kind of a water filled section kind of surrounding these tubes. And so the heat transfer is from the tube out into more kind of the water um, uh, bath section. And, and uh, that's how the, the heat transfer is generated. Um, these fire tube boilers, we don't see a whole lot of those. Um, they're generally smaller sizes. And, um, you know, most of the, the boiler systems that we see are water tube boilers to where the, uh, the water itself is contained in a pipe or a, a tube. 
um, and the heat transfer is through the firebox into those um, into those tubes uh, sections. Tank heaters, yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> um, so a couple of different designs we'll talk about. One is D-type boilers, um, one is O-type boilers, and the other is A-type boilers. The D-type boiler, this is a very um, common design that we see uh, for larger size um, units especially. Um, the D-type boilers have, uh, are, are typically, uh, you know, can be package boilers um, opposed to field directed units. Uh, they generally have a, sh a significantly shorter firebox, uh, very high heat transfer rates. This is kind of one of those design criteria, how many BTU per square foot of uh, uh, burner area that, uh, that the heat release is. Um, <clears throat> it's important to uh, ensure the high quality boiler feed water and chemically treat the systems properly. So. And those fire tube kind of designs, these, you know, these, I'm sorry, the water tube designs, you know, these D-type boilers are water tube boilers, so uh, the boiler uh, water inside that's being heated to convert to steam um, has to have a, uh, a certain purity to keep from scaling inside um, uh, the tubes. You know, that scaling inside the tubes impacts the heat transfer. So if you build and you precipitate inside those tubes, that's a problem. Um, also, trying to, you know, that scale or that um, any sort of impurities, you know, the boiler has to be, have a certain blowdown cycle to try to purge those from uh, the unit. And, you know, that, uh, so having a high purity water for all these designs is, is um, a critical part. Um, A-type boilers, uh, these units um, we see a little less of, but, you know, these units have multiple steam drums. Um, and, and can have some issues with uh, a little bit of starvation and a little less uh, beneficial as far as the circulation pattern in the boiler. Um, and we've got some diagrams of these, maybe easier to show. Yeah. Um, so a D-type boiler, um, it kind of has this kind of uh, D look uh, design to it. Um, so in a typical boiler situation, we've got a steam drum at the top where where, um, where we're generating the desired steam pressure. Um, there's a water level inside that steam drum, and so the steam is coming off the top, and we're maintaining that water level. And that water then is circulated down through to the mud drum, and it's kind of there's a natural circulation that occurs through the boiler um, to circulate this water and generate the contact time for the heating. And as the steam load's pulled off, um, we're adding more boiler feed water into the steam drum, typically, uh, to kind of, you know, feed the process. So, um, you know, as we're heating these up, like we say, the, the hotter that boiler feed water comes in, you know, the less cooling effect that we get in the steam drum, the less energy is needed to reheat that water to satisfy our steam demand off the top of that. Um, our mud drum at the bottom is typically the area where we're going to blow down or um, purge any sort of uh, impurities in the, in the uh, that are collecting. And so, you know, as part of that maintenance operation is to blow the boiler down. Um, the O-type boiler is, uh, you know, is very similar. It's just more of a symmetrical design around the firebox, and the tubes are kind of uh, circuit, you know, arranged on the outer sections. Um, the uh, you know, same kind of situation with the steam drum at the top and the mud drum at the bottom. Um, you know, this A-style boiler is a little more, um, a little, little different uh, design as far as the tubes um, and, the, and the firebox. Um, and there's multiple steam drums in the header of these. So, you know, all these situations, there's not much we can do about it. These boilers kind of are designed kind of how they are, but, you know, understanding uh, a little bit of the operation is, is always helpful in um, assessing the efficiency of those units. Um, let's see if that's anything else. I don't know, we had a couple slides here about, I guess, the package boiler versus um, you know, typically a lot of the, most of the boilers that we see these days, unless you're at a, a certain industries, are package boilers, and these package boilers come, um, you know, in various sizes, but they, you know, they can get up to 250 mm BTUs, um, you know, and greater. Uh, but you know, package boiler basically is is a design that you know the boiler ships. Uh, it's, it's erected at at the boiler manufacturer's shop. It comes in and and requires basically utilities be hooked up as far as the steam piping and the water piping 
um, you know, fuel supply and electrical connections. So it's, uh, it's a quick, easy way to get a boiler in your site and, and get it up and running. Um, and uh, anyhow, so a lot of the boilers that we see are, are these package boilers. Um, what's that? A lot of temporary boilers are package boilers for sure, yeah. Um, sorry, you guys, pardon me for a minute, we can grab another drink of water here. <clears throat> All right, so the next section of the slides that we're going to go through are more of the, some of the downstream and ancillary parts of a boiler or a heater system, and ma mainly boiler systems. Um, And so the note here, you know, that there's some, I guess, misunderstanding or contradiction in the subpart D rule as to, as to how far downstream of the combustion source the energy assessment is supposed to cover. So we've kind of had some discussions already kind of informed or today when we talked to the energy assessment part, but the actual, um, the rule language, EPA talks and defines energy use system in the rule as the, um, Systems located on site that use energy, steam, hot water, or electricity provided by the affected boiler or process heater. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. And then process heating, <clears throat> compressed air systems, machine drives, motors, pumps, fans, process cooling, facility heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, hot water systems, building envelope, lighting, other systems using steam, hot water, process heat, or electricity provided by the affected boiler. Um, but in the energy assessment part, um, the rule uh, talks about you know, an evaluation of the operating uh, affected boiler systems, so specifications of the energy use systems. Uh, so that's you know, looking at those specifications of those energy use systems uh, and operating and maintenance procedures and an inventory of major en energy consuming systems and equipment. Um, so it requires the assessor to recognize these downstream equipment, such as pollution uh, control equipment and the actual process um, consumers themselves, uh, but not officially analyze that downstream equipment with respect to its own individual energy efficiency. So we've kind of talked about that in, uh, in the energy assessment part, but um, you know, when we do the energy assessment, those major downstream users, we're going to inventory those, but we don't have to go into the efficiency or the, um, uh, you know, analyzing those as part of the energy assessment. Um, generally speaking, though, the energy assessor does need to recognize the importance of a variety of boiler and heater equipment, uh, as well as those downstream equipment. So, you know, kind of that caveat is, uh, I think the intention of having that inventory of downstream users, the expectation is you would know how those downstream users affects the boiler and the boiler load. So, um, you know, kind of as we talked about, you know, if we have batch processes that take a certain amount of heat load for a small amount of time and then are off, you know, those are going to affect how the boiler performs. And so, you know, we want to understand those and if there's some, uh, efficiency or a project to kind of control or improve how we're delivering steam or um, uh, you know the outputs from our boiler process heater to that batch process then that would be fair game to look at as far as the energy assessment um, all right so the next we're going to go through some of these other components of um, of the system that the rule kind of requires that we look at uh, for an energy assessment so these are the the parts of the overall uh, energy uh, generation and delivery systems. Um, so we've kind of talked about the boiler area, um, boiler feed water economizer and deaerator. So, um, you know, in a boiler si situation, you know, this feed water system is very important to how the boiler performs and the overall, uh, you know, operation and efficiency of the unit. Uh, where um, the boiler feed water itself uh, typically has a deaerator, uh, you know, in, in that process, and the intent of the deaerator is to kind of drive off, uh, you know, any unwanted oxygen or or entrained air in the uh, in the water system um, to basically make that water as pure as possible. 
so the deaerator typically will um, use the uh, heating energy of the system to uh, basically flash off some of that water and then recondense it before it's fed into the, into the uh, uh, steam drum. So the deaerator itself, this is one area where, you know, can potentially be overlooked by maintenance. Um, you know, one thing that we look for when we do energy assessment, it's a good idea when, during outages that these are opened up and inspected and gone through. Um, you know, these can be kind of a black box uh, situation in some of the, the facilities and, um, you know, the inspection of the deaeration system is, is important um, part of the, of the maintenance of the unit and uh, can, you know, it can be an area where we're losing, um, uh, you know, steam or other kind of uh, energy in that system. Uh, an economizer or feed water heater provides significant energy recovery benefit. So um, an economizer, typically this uh, boiler feed water before we feed the deaerator, we're going through a set of coils that are located in, typically in uh, the exhaust stack or the heater exit um, of the boiler. And that hot, that hot process gas off the boiler is then going to in turn heat up the um, heat up the feed water before it goes into the boiler. So we're trying to get the temperature of that feed water as hot as possible, um, you know, to minimize the amount of energy it takes to uh, convert it to steam. Um, you know, there still are systems that we find sometimes that, that don't have economizers and, you know, aren't, um, you know, the other thing that can happen with these economizers, you know, is inspection is, is important in these units as well. Going in and making sure that soot buildup or any sort of um, uh, contamination or scaling on the outside of these economizers, minimizing the heat input or the heat transfer uh, to the boiler feed water. You know, we see a lot of units that haven't been inspected in a while. And this is one of those areas where you can kind of see that design criteria as far as what the temperature drop is supposed to be of that stat gas across these um, economizer coils. And a lot of cases, you know, after years and years of service, you know, that efficiency has, has dropped. And, you know, we have had cases where we've calculated, um, you know, the efficiency, and, you know, to, to, you know, what it would take to either replace or go in and, um, uh, you know, well, well, inspect for sure, but to replace these units with a more efficient design, and a lot of times that has a pretty good payback. Um, it depends on the size of the boiler for sure, though. Um, all right, so, and the feed water, you know, this is kind of in that energy transfer part of the, uh, the efficiency determination or, or calculation. Um, you know, it takes one BTU to raise one pound of water, one degrees Fahrenheit, so kind of that specific heat of water um, so that, uh, you know, that, that basic uh, uh, property of water, you know, is used to determine how much energy is needed to uh, convert the steam. Um, typically feed water outlet temperatures that we're looking for or see are anywhere between 240 F to 320 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And, you know, this, these can vary depending on the steam operating pressures of the boiler um, and other characteristics of the system. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the energy balance surrounding the feed water economizer. So as we're looking at um, how to determine efficiencies and, uh, you know, how the uh, economizer will be working and, and heating the, uh, the boiler feed water up, um, you know, we have uh, kind of this basic, uh, the heat input or the requirement as a function of the mass flow rate of the feed water in pounds per hour, um, which we can measure. Um, and the specific heat of the water, which is that one uh, BTU per pound per degree Fahrenheit, and then the delta T in the inlet versus the outlet. Um, so, uh, uh, question here, how do we handle the fact that the desired feed water temperature is 280 degrees Fahrenheit? So, um, so if we're seeing temperatures that, that high, I guess, uh, I don't know, basic physics, what does that, what does that mean that the water um, still in liquid form at that temperature. Why, why is that? It's under pressure, right? So all these pressure tubes and, and the systems under pressure, so um, so we're able to get a higher temperature in the in the uh, feed water, um, you know, without converting it to steam at that point. Um, 
Yeah, so. Yep, so the CP all is, is pressure specific as well. Um, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll vary uh, depending on what pressure the water's under. Um, all right, so, so we have to consider the specific heat of the water, vapor saturated with the liquid, you know, the CP. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <laughs> get another drink of water here. So the CP of the water vapor um, with the liquid. So the water vapor CP, like I say, is less than the um, than the than the water itself. Um, then we've got a question there: Are we forgetting something? Um, so the other component uh, in how much energy it takes to uh, convert this water. So we have the specific heat of the water, and as we said, this you know this is under ambient pressure, so 212. As we increase the pressure of the system, this temperature that we can um, drive the water up to as far as, um, you know, and maintain it in a liquid form it increases. So in that case, we're at 280 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, we're still using the specific heat of water at that one pound per, or one MMBTU per pound per degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then when we actually flash or convert to a vapor, there's a certain energy that's required, the latent heat of vaporization to actually make that phase transfer. And that's, um, that's the 970.4 uh, BTUs per pound. So as we're uh, looking at a, a system, at this point we're in our condensate phase, and this is our boiler feed water and condensate. We're, you know, when we make those changes, we're at the specific heat of water. And then it takes, takes this amount of energy to make that um, uh, phase change. And then at that point, we have another specific heat of the vapor so as we add more heat to it, now we're driving the temperature up based on that property. So, um, so it, it, within the boiler itself, you know, this specific heat of water, like I say, is the condensate system all the way up to that liquid side of the steam drum. And then the steam drum, we're making this jump to uh, the specific heat of vapor. And then at that point, this, um, you know, we're, we've got saturated steam at this point. Um, the, uh, all right, so, so the superheated steam um, converts wet steam to dry steam. So we have, uh, um, you know, we reach a point where we have uh, saturated steam, uh, and the more heat that we uh, introduce to that system, uh, we start to superheat that steam. So we start to dry it out, and that uh, superheated steam, um, you know, it has more energy, you know, in that pound of steam, uh, and that is usually used in C for power generation for turbines when you want to um, get a higher pressure, higher uh, uh, temperature steam. Um, you know, a lot of uh, you know more process conditions run at the saturated steam level. So, you know, superheated steam is is kind of a unique situation, and uh, the boiler will have a superheater section to it to where those steamed coils then we'll be up higher in the furnace. And so after the steam drum, we've got another set of heat exchangers that are um, transferring heat into the steam itself to, to superheat it. Um, those superheater sections are prone to leaks and corrosion. Once you start putting a superheater up in the process gas area, there's a lot, it's prone to um, abrasion and corrosion issues. And uh, so, you know, there are high maintenance, takes a lot of, you know, outage and inspection times for a superheater section. Um, but, you know, depending on the process condition, superheater, uh, superheated steam may be required. How many folks here utilize superheated steam? Do so you guys do? Is that for the turbine applications or waste heat recovery? So that would be in the coils that um, kind of after you process uh, reactors. Boilers do too, yeah. So what pressure do you guys run? Steam. Okay, a lot of different step down here. Um, yeah, 
and look at the temperature changes and kind of how, um, you know, that efficiency across the superheater section, um, you know, all that, you know, is, is something that would be analyzed during the energy assessment. Um, we talked about, you know, fans and kind of the air systems on our boilers and, and um, process heaters as being a critical component, right? Our oxygen and how much air we're putting in is our biggest tool to uh, optimize the efficiency of the unit. Um, there, there may be multiple fans on a boiler, you know, depending on the system, how closed it is. Um, you know, at a minimum, you may have an, an induced draft fan, which would be, you know, on the exit of the boiler. A lot of times it would be downstream of some of the pollution control equipment so that you're um, pulling a draft through the whole system uh, and making sure that you have enough static pressure to overcome all the pressure drops in the air pollution control equipment and, um, you know, and, and maintaining your uh, uh, desired draft through the boiler itself. Those fans can be electric driven. Uh, they can be steam turbines, so we're actually using the steam uh, generated off the boiler to drive the, uh, the fan uh, to supply the, the fan air. Um, you know, fans, in a, you know, when you get into some of the larger, more complex boilers, um, you know, this becomes an area where, you know, you could focus a lot of attention on energy assessment. Um, you know, on some of the solid fuel boilers that we, that we work on and, and see, you know, there's different levels of fans where you've got different air staging where you want to put um, tertiary air or secondary air into the system so that you have, uh, um, you know, directed air coming at different parts of the firebox to help complete that combustion and also to help minimize the carryover of particulates and things like that. Um, so those systems, the fans become more critical and are a little more complex. Um, but in general, you know, some of the things that, uh, that you can see with fans, you know, dampers being, um, you know, the actuators on fan dampers being damaged to where the operator's moving the thing, but, you know, trying to get uh, different control or close the damper, but, you know, the linkages aren't working, those kind of things. All those are kind of physical things that you can see in the field that would impact, um, you know, how the boiler is working. And during the, the tuning, you'll, you know, we'll see that if you're trying to adjust the air and, and the emissions profile's not changing, then something's going on with, with the damper or, you know, something in the, on the fan system. Um, you know, nowadays, you know, the energy efficiencies, you know, you'll see some, you know, d depending on the application, obviously it's in, in a more hazardous atmosphere, you don't see a lot of electric motors, but, you know, a lot of um, uh, fans now will be more, uh, uh, have a VFD or some other, um, you know, drive to be more efficient and control the, uh, you know, the fan speed as well. But in general, our, you know, our temperature becomes very important. So our boiler, we're talking about how we, uh, you know, different air temperatures impact the density of the air, it impacts the fan performance. So each fan is designed for its kind of operating range in the system. So if you have a fan in the stat gas, um, you know, it's designed to provide that static pressure uh, requirement at a certain temperature. So the hotter the stat gas, you know, the bigger the fan that you need because there's more volume to get the mass out of it. As, as you start introducing, you know, economizers and dropping your stat temperature and changing those things, you start to change the performance of the fan. All of a sudden now, the fan that, you know, was handling um, 400 degree Fahrenheit air, if it starts to handle, you know, 300 degree Fahrenheit air, that's a whole different dynamic. And so, you know, in some cases when those changes have been made in a system over time, you know, sometimes the fans are all of a sudden out of their operating performance or not, you know, in a good, good operating range. So, you know, those are things that you want to look at from, um, uh, you know, from the operational standpoint, you know, what, what changes may have impacted uh, some of those fan performances. Or, you know, vice versa, if we've got you know, a fan that's designed for a very efficient economizer and an air-to-air -air heat exchanger for the preheating the combustion air and all of a sudden we're not getting that temperature drop across it, we've changed, we've changed the performance of the fan. You know, and typically the, the fans will be designed to, you know, they're not going to be operating at 100% speed. They'll have, you know, turn up and turn down range, but, um, you know, something to keep in consideration. And this is kind of, you know, the, the classic uh, Boyles, Charles, and uh, 
gave the Sachs law, you know, as far as the relationships for pressure, temperature, and volume, you know, those become important for, um, you know, performance of fans and the fan curve itself. So the, you know, the pressure and volume um, inverse relationships and uh, the relationship between volume and temperature. Um, another thing when we're looking at the performance of these systems and trying to, um, you know, evaluate the overall efficiency, you know, your stack testing data becomes uh, a very important um, tool. Um, your stack test measurements, you know, we're talking about measuring some different compounds uh, as far as, you know, putting in, the, you know, one-line readings and things like that, but your stack testing maybe getting more detailed information on, uh, you know, velocity pressures and temperatures and, um, you know, a lot of the different parameters, airflow and that sort of thing that, um, uh, you know, that, that, that the, uh, for the boiler performance. Um, you know, real-time NOx, CO, VOC data, those kind of things also, you know, during the stack testing events, you know, is basically performing a lot of the tune-up analysis that we're doing and it's a very good indicator of how the boiler is performing. So, you know, that information, that data, and these are just some of the typical stack test calculations that, um, uh, you know, and parameters that are monitored during uh, stack testing. But as far as the fan performance, you know, being able to get the, the airflow uh, measurements from the stack test, you know, under those, those conditions can be helpful in, in uh, analyzing the system. Um, these are just some of the emissions calculations. Uh, I don't, won't dwell on those too much. All right, um, combustion air preheaters. So, kind of talked about, you know, we talked about the economizer for heating up the um, boiler feed water um, and to try to optimize that, that temperature before uh, we introduce the water into the, the boiler. Uh, on the the air side, we also, um, you know, a, a good practice, and it's, you know, we'll see units with this and some units without it, but is to have, um, you know, an air to air heat exchanger for the, you know, for preheating the combustion air. So, and especially in cold weather climates where, um, you know, where you can have, uh, you know, zero degree temperature ambient air, um, you know, trying to heat that combustion air up prior to introducing it into the, uh, the combustion process, it has a huge benefit for uh, the efficiency of the system. So, um, you know, during the energy assessment, you know, and, you know basically it's, uh, you know, it's an air to air heat exchanger, your fin sizes of the heat exchanger are important component. You know, you can see some fins that are really, really tight fin size. Some heat exchangers have a little uh, more open fin size design. Uh, it all depends on the characteristics of your stack gas in some cases that you're doing the heat exchange with. Um, in some of those instances where we see uh, coal or wood-fired boilers that have more particulate carryover, there's a very uh, open fin design, a little less efficiency in the, in the design of the system to keep from entraining particles and that sort of thing in the, in the heat exchanger itself. Uh, for natural gas systems and more cleaner bur burning fuels, uh, you have a more efficient uh, air to air heat exchanger because you don't have as much concern about um, contamination or blinding of the of the heat exchanger itself. These are areas um, that that do require some maintenance and inspection over time. So, um, you know, being able to uh, go in and and uh, inspect the heat exchanger surfaces and make sure that there's not um, build up or accumulation on those uh, surfaces is. is Usually something that needs to occur, yeah, depending on the boiler, every couple of years, uh, an inspection of that system. Um, you know, these are potential areas for air leaks and other things as well uh, around these uh, heat exchanger units. You guys, Doug, you guys have air to air heat exchangers in you alls Yeah, 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 good point. Um, it can also be steam assisted, so where we're using more, not just using the flue gas, but also adding some steam uh, into these heat exchangers as well to, to 
to heat up the uh, combustion air. Um, all right, so turbines, steam turbines, back pressure turbines. Uh, so these would be one of those energy users, typically downstream. Um, the turbine, pro uh, you know, the turbines basically come. There's usually two different types of a turbine. Uh, it's a back pressure turbine where we're bringing in high pressure steam. Um, we're driving the turbine, and the exhaust from the turbine is still in the steam phase. And so usually we'll use this to knock down a higher pressure. Uh, steam down to something lower, 250 pound steam coming out that then can be used further down in the process. So turbines, a lot of times, you know, you'll see these where they're driving a fan, a pump, a motor, or generating electricity. Um, you know, these turbines can be used as basically a pressure reducing device that then would supply, you know, additional steam down into the process to be used again. You know, in, in, a, in an efficient steam process design, um, you know, this is kind of uh, what, you know, what you normally see where you generate a high pressure steam out of the boiler. Um, you know, it's more efficient to drive and put more energy into the, the steam and then that high pressure steam gets stepped down, it gets used. As that steam gets used, then it, it steps down the pressure to a lower pressure and gets used in another service. And then, you know, even that 250 pound steam may get stepped down to 50 pound steam and used somewhere for another service. So, being able to utilize as much of that steam energy um, before converting that to condensate and coming back into the boiler, um, you know, is, is a good process design. And, um, you know, th those are areas where, you know, sometimes we're looking for those other places where steam could be used as opposed to electricity or something like that for, uh, for an energy source. Um, the other type of uh, turbine that is typically out there is a uh, extraction condensing turbine. So this is more of a two-stage process to where we can you know, extract some steam off of the turbine itself and use it similar to the back pressure turbine. So this would be another area where we'd step the steam down to some lower, um, uh, some lower uh, steam pressure. Um, but also, you know, go ahead and, and, and this, in these extraction, um, you know, we're also bringing, driving the steam down to condensate level and return a condensate back to, to the boiler. Um, so we're extracting more uh, pressure drop and temperature out of the steam uh, before condensing it. Um, you know, kind of back to the energy assessment, you know, this is the only part that we need to go to during the energy assessment component. The actual work being done by the turbine, the turbine internals and efficiency we would not be something that we would, we would consider. But the turbine itself, if it's part of our steam users, would need to be on our inventory of, of equipment that, that we have in our energy assessment report. All right, so bag houses, filter fabrics, dust collectors. So we've got a couple slides in here just on general, I guess, uh, pollution control devices. These would be add-on equipment after um, the boiler combustion itself. Does anybody here have uh, add-on air pollution control equipment after y'all's boilers or process heaters? SCR, so more for the uh, NOx control, but not so much for particulate or any other acid gases or anything like that. On well, the combustion terms, yep. Um, so yeah, so we kind of won't spend a whole lot of time here, but the, uh, you know, all these add-on particulate control devices, um, acid gas control devices, SCRs, have, you know, impacts on the combustion process and the fact that, you know, these are points that the air, the air system has to um, accommodate and work through these different pressure drops. You know, the bag houses, you know, are uh, one of the more significant pressure drop systems uh, along with you know, kind of some of the wet scrubbers. Um, you know, and, you know, maintenance of these bag houses and minimizing that pressure drop and staying on top of that, you know, aside from the benefits of, of the uh, prevention of pollution or, you know, ca capturing the particulates and things, you know, it also has an impact on uh, the combustion process itself. Um, electrostatic precipitators downstream, um, you know, these are also common. Uh, particulate control devices on various uh, boiler uh, situation. Um, 
you know, and this uh, electrostatic precipitator is basically, uh, you know, charged fields and plates that are um, collecting, uh, you know, dust and particulates that are passing through the stack. Uh, these are uh, very efficient units and, um, uh, but use, are very large electricity users uh, using Ohm's law to, um, to attract those particles to a charged plate and then periodically the charged plates are um, discharged and dust discharged from the system. Um, you know, these systems are uh, less pressure drop than, than some of the bag houses but also have an, an effect on the air handling system. Well, part of the energy assessment in the in the uh, the criteria is being able to evaluate all the pollution control equipment and you know in the rule itself. So um, that that knowledge base of um, uh, of the energy assessor, if it's applicable. So a lot of the stuff's not applicable to you guys if you are at a facility where your energy system, your boiler, was connected to the pollution control equipment or had some of these devices. The energy assessor would need to be able to um, uh, have the knowledge to understand how that uh, impacts the system. But really, from an energy assessment standpoint, you know, aside from the electricity generation and usage uh, in these systems, you know, that's something that would could be evaluated as, um, you know, the amount of amperage and you know the performance of the pollution control. Not necessarily the particulate removal part, but you know, is it using the electricity? You know, does it have some short somewhere or? Um, no, no, not nothing like that. I'm just saying, if, if you had a boiler that had an ESP at, uh, in the stack gas for pollution control, um, the, the overall system uh, assessment, energy assessment, that, that pollution control device would be part of the boiler system. That would be a component of the energy assessment. And so, you know, part of that energy assessment talks about some of the electrical usage. So, you know, you might think, I think EPA's intent was, you know, if you had a fan that you could benefit from having a BFD on the fan, um, that would be a potential energy opportunity in the assessment where, you know, it's on the, it's on the part of the boiler system but to improve the overall efficiency, not necessarily the efficiency of converting fuel to steam energy, but the overall efficiency of the boiler itself, you know, as an energy um, envelope. But I, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of focus placed on ele the electrical systems, but it, it, you know, there is a mention of it in the, in the rule. Um, you know, but, but also how the, how the pollution control device affects the combustion process is probably the more, um, um, you know, more relevant part to the energy assessment. You know, and, and you know, aside from pressure drops and maintenance kind of issues like that, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of other uh, impacts. Um, so kind of similar with you know a wet scrubber. So this would be you know potentially an area that we would need to look at for um, uh, you know on a boiler that was equipped with this kind of air pollution control device uh, for particulates. Um, since we're kind of not really relevant here. We'll You're relevant, okay, all right, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so do you have a uh, wet scrubber on a, uh, a boiler? Yeah. So for the for the boiler mac energy assessment, you know, we would if it was on an affected unit, so one of the boilers that's con, uh, affected by the rule, then then it would be you know be part of that energy assessment, um, you know, as part of that boiler system. If it's not on one of those affected units, it wouldn't necessarily be covered by by this particular rule and and the energy assessment that we're talking about. But um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll go through, we can go through that though, just uh, as a general, you know, the, you know, the wet scrubbers, you know, most of what we see are the Venturi style wet scrubbers. Is that kind of what, what you guys have in place? Um, and so, uh, you know, for these systems, um, you know, the, the standard uh, velocity, you know, it, through the, 
uh, through the unit, we're adding water or scrubbing medium here and generating, catching the particulate matter and, um, you know, as the stat gas makes the turn and goes through the scrubber system, the particulates kind of impact the side walls and the bottom and um, are captured and, and carried out. These, these units are, from a particulate matter standpoint, becoming a lot less efficient or less able to meet a lot of the rules that are in place now. Um, you know, you're seeing a lot of wet scrubbers replaced with bag houses or um, electrostatic precipitators to meet some of the um, tighter emission limits on particulate. But um, you see more of these wet scrubbers in, um, you know, the processes, uh, you know, manufacturing processes either. Uh, I don't see a lot on rotary kind of like kilns and other process units that are in the um, agriculture or uh, fertilizer industry. Um, uh, but yeah, anyhow, so the, there's a lot of pressure drop around the wet scrubber itself. And that's kind of one of the biggest impacts on, on a boiler operation from these units is, uh, aside from meeting the emission limits, but, you know, the impact to the fan, you know, if we start to lose our water pressure here or have a change in, in how we're flooding this chamber, um, that all impacts our pressure drop and um, the performance of our fan, our ability to get airflow through the system. So, you know, different man monitoring the differential pressure and the flow rates, um, on these wet scrubbers is, is critical to making sure that the overall boiler system is going to be operating uh, efficiently. Um, all right, SO2 flue gas desulfurization. So, um, you know, this is a, a technology um, uh, that you see added to some boiler systems. Um, to, uh, to remove acid gas or SO2 or HCl to where, you know, the flue gas comes into, um, uh, you know, the, the flue gas desulfurization unit, basically a contact chamber. Uh, there's a spray tower where a, a caustic or alkaline media is sprayed in to, um, to neutralize the, um, the acid gas, um, and then that's uh, collected, um, uh, collected in, the, in the system. Um, and then the clean, the clean gas is going out the stack. Um, you know, pressure drop kind of being an issue here uh, for uh, any boiler that would be uh, um, attached to a unit like this. Or, um, you know, for refineries, uh, the waste gas scrubber. And I'm not quite as familiar with this. So this is on the FCCU process that where you guys would have flue gas desulfurization. So this would be kind of a non-regulated kind of component, right? Uh, Doug, you guys have? Yeah. All right. I'm not sure why this slides in here, though. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure why that slides in here. Like some of these slides I inherited from John, and I wasn't sure. I'm not sure exactly. Trying to follow his logic on some of these, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure this is kind of relevant to our, our uh, discussion today. Um, and it kind of similar to the selective catalytic reduction for NOx. So you guys, does anybody here have NOx control on their boilers and process heaters or you know, both? S and CR, yeah. So, the, um, uh, so, so these systems, um, let's say, are, are, are designed to uh, reduce NOx emissions. Um, you know, in, in this whole energy assessment evaluation um, uh, and, and boiler tuning, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. I'm not sure, Neil, have you guys done like some of the tune-ups uh, with with these uh, SCR units or? Okay. Did you guys have any impact on the EA as far as when you guys were looking at these units? And when you guys did like your stack monitoring, were you guys before or after some of these units? After, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So doing the stack monitoring after one of these units then allows you to, when we do the tune-ups, I guess there may be something to kind of talk through a little bit. When you guys did the tune-ups with these units in place, uh, where you're measuring after the unit. So when you're doing the NOx uh, CO kind of balance, kind of how did that process work? 
Oh, yeah, okay, okay, yep. Gotcha. All right, so, um, so yeah, so some considerations when we're doing tune-ups, you know, if we're changing the knocks, you know, if our intent is to, um, you know, make sure we're meeting our knocks limits and balancing our air to optimize that, then it's going to be important to um, consider these units and do our assessment and tune-ups kind of after them so we're getting the full effect of, of the impacts of adjusting the air on the system. Um, but anyhow, so, you know, from an overall energy assessment standpoint, you know, kind of as Neil mentioned, I think these, you know, these are part of, part of the boiler system, but really not a lot of uh, additional you know, energy requirements or items where maybe there'd be opportunities for uh, improvement. Um, you know, the heat recovery steam generators, um, you know, like we mentioned, so this would be kind of those areas where we would use for waste heat type uh, recovery. Um, you know, most common, they wouldn't be um, regulated under the boiler mac rule unless we had one of these duct burners in there where we're, you know, firing gas to enhance the steam or the heat uh, generation and, and steam generation. Um, but, you know, these, uh, these waste heat uh, uh, steam generators, you know, it's an excellent efficiency source where we're using a, a hot duct stack gas or process gas to generate steam you know, and, and basically extract some energy that we've already uh, generated somewhere else and try to get some useful um, energy out of that, that basically wasted uh, process gas. So it sounds like you guys have a lot of these in place. Um, you know, as we mentioned, if, if, if it's just a, a, you know, a unit inside of a, a hot process gas that's not um, got some additional combustion to it, then it's not going to be regulated under this boiler mac rule and it's not going to be a part of the um, of the energy as assessment, but if we do have some combustion component to it, where we're uh, got another burner in there, then it's going to be one of the regulated units to look at. Um, you know, these uh, heat recovery steam generators, um, you know, are kind of mini uh, boiler type systems where we've got the the water tubes, um, you know, and we're you know we've got the steam drum at the top where we're um, you know, collecting that uh, steam for use and, uh, you know, insulation, kind of another area where that thermal imaging may, may be helpful to, to look at, you know, any poten potential heat losses and things from areas that we, that we don't want uh, to happen in those units. Downstream, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. It's, uh, it's, I think, you know, some thought needs to go into how to tune, you know, one of these systems that needs to look at, you know, the emission limits and, um, yeah, I mean, that impact on, you know, the consumables as far as your uh, ammonia injection and those kind of things. And, um, you know, yeah, it's, a, it's a lot to consider in this. So yeah, yeah so that's a good point. SCR itself, it doesn't. So it, it, like I say, it kind of comes in that optimization kind of tuning and 
um, yeah, the, the SCR itself is not required or, you know, under the, under the MAC uh, 5D, but, it, you know, the impact on the overall combustion source when we're evaluating it, you know, there, there does have some impacts. All right. Um, this is kind of one of those potential steam users kind of uh, areas uh, that the slide John had in the, in the presentation uh, for thermocompressors. Um, you know, these are those kind of motive devices where we'll use, um, you know, a higher pressure, uh, smaller volume of steam to induce a, a flow, um, you know, to basically um, move a, a process fluid or uh, a gas, um, you know, and, and you'll see these in a lot of different uses and places out, you know, especially in those areas where, um, you know, there's a hazardous environment or atmosphere and we need to move fluids, but we don't want to use electricity or those kind of things, uh, the steam. Thermal compressors are, are a place where, um, you, so this would be one of those steam users in the energy assessment system. You know, and you know, one of the, uh, you know, some of these uses that we talked about, the reformers and the, and the steam uh, thermal uh, compressors, I mean, you know, these are areas where the steam is, is consumed. So, and then, you know, in the, from an efficiency standpoint, you know, we, you know, recovering that condensate and being able to reuse the steam is a, is a, is a good process. Some, use, some users in the steam system, you don't have that ability to recover um, kind of, you know, the heat value out of those systems. They're, it's, it's all consumed in the, in the actual process itself. Um, all right. How are we doing on break time? What time is our break? Three and a half hour? Okay. Um, all right. So pressure relief devices, PRVs. So this is um, another area when we're looking at the steam distribution system um, that are a uh, component or uh, area for energy loss. So the pressure relief device itself um, are where we're trying to step down a uh, higher pressure steam to a lower pressure steam. We basically in introduce uh, an inefficiency to kind of knock that pressure down. Um, you know, there's safety valves uh, attached to those. You know, these are areas um, that can be higher maintenance kind of areas, insulation, you know, has, has been removed or taken off. You know, there's a lot of fittings and flanges around here, opportunities for steam leaks. Um, you know, the, the condensate collection off of these as well. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, one thing you'll see if you're not bleeding this condensate off and you're carrying condensate through the system, um, you know, we want to get that condensate out of the system uh, if possible. You know, this, anytime we have these pressure drops, we have the ability to um, generate some of the condensate and, and I need to clean that up a bit. Um, you know, and the other thing too, this pressure safety relief valves, you know, these are an area too dependent on the design of the system, the downstream usage. You know, we've seen safety relief valves in some large headers and part of the the, you know, the system design was, you know, when the downstream user goes down and we're blowing off a lot of steam, that's a lot of um, loss of energy or, you know, a lot of uh, money and efforts gone into making that steam and, you know, these areas where we have safety relief valves and pressure uh, relief devices, you know, if those are going off on some routine frequency, then that's a, a, an area to maybe investigate a little bit further. Um, you know, we, we don't want to have those areas where we're routinely blowing off steam and losing that, that energy. Yep. So this would be part of the system walk down and, and evaluation. So, you know, when the, um, you know, we're doing the thermal energy and you saw the piping and stuff that we were looking at, you know, these, you know, these systems are going to be areas in that piping. Um, to where, you know, we're stepping down the pressure for use in, in the process, um, you know, either right, you know, usually this pressure drop may happen right local to, uh, uh, you know, a user or um, it may be in a, you know, right ahead of a header, um, you know, so this is kind of part of that steam distribution piping that would be part of the assessment. So that physical inspection component. So we're we'll looking for those, you know, um, you know, as far as the pressure re reducing valve and
Yeah. It's the user component. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. So the pressure relief device itself is not an energy user, right? This is part of the steam distribution system, right? So this is, um, you know, this is where we're, you know, converting the pressure uh, from, say, you know, 500 pounds of steam on this side down to 250 because our end user then needs the 250 pound steam, right? End user. But the actual steam piping distribution component is part of the assessment. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great, great question. Safety relief could be on the turbine as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So the better use here would be have a turbine that's dr driving that steam pressure down, um, or you've used some some steam further up. And a lot of times where you see these pressure reducing valves and things maybe on a bypass. So if your turbine's down, but you still have downstream users that need to have that lower step down steam, you know, then you, they would come through a, a PRV and and um, get conditioned for that. Or you know, slip streams or smaller users that uh, out there. But yeah, that's. That's a good point. I mean, these pressure reducing valves is, you know, in, in a sense, an, an inefficiency in the system. And, you know, if there was another way to use that energy to step down the pressure, that's a preferred option and maybe an area during the energy assessment that gets evaluated. Um, all right, so steam systems. So, you know, like I say, we're talking about these uh, distribution kind of components, um, you know, not the end users themselves, but how we're distributing the steam for use. Um, and these are typically large, um, you know, and, and can be very complicated and complex. And, you know, as part of the energy assessment, you know, the, the ideal situation is to be able to get, you know, the, the basic steam system diagrams or the P&IDs from those systems or at least a process flow type diagram that would be helpful to kind of understand the end users, where the different press steam pressures are, um, you know, and kind of understand that uh, that distribution system uh, component of things, and you know the um, you know kind of as we mentioned before, these systems can be a little bit complex, and and the you know there may be offsite generators of steam that are supplying steam to the system. There may be steam coming into the system that was generated from a non-affected unit that's feeding the same header. So you know how we draw those battery limits around what we're going to look at, and um, you know what end users are we going to uh, limit ourselves to uh, can become kind of challenging. I mean, it's, you know, in, in some situations, certain boilers may feed a certain part of the plant and it's clear cut on how to, to draw those lines. Um, you know, in other systems, it may be a very open ended, you know, uh, uh, steam header that's fed by a lot of different uh, units. And so it makes it a little bit harder to try to figure out exactly what, um, what units we're going to look at. Um, you know, and, and having that reduction of how much percentage of the system to look at kind of helps draw, you know, helps narrow that focus down. So if the steam system's overly complex, and but we can, you know, look at 20% of it and kind of define, you know, that we know this 20% is fed by the affected units, then that kind of helps narrow, uh, narrows that inspection and that focus down. Um, that's a good question. So I would, I would say, you know, that flange part going into the heat exchange. So, yeah. So like if there's, if the steam, um, uh, you know, the heat exchanger itself, you know, we're not going to look at the efficiency of the heat exchanger and, you know, and look at that, you know, <coughs> obviously it may be some benefit in trying to understand that when you're going through this uh, system, but from a, from a regulatory, you know, coverage, um, you know, that, that, that becomes an end user, you know, that's the use, the ultimate use of the steam. Um, all right. All right. Steam traps. These are another component or area in the distribution system that can be problematic and, and an area for, um, you know, the thermal imaging. This is kind of some pictures that uh, that we have taken of uh, some of the steam traps. 
Um, so steam traps are kind of those areas where we have some residual steam left over. <coughs> we're trying to drive it into condensate and return it back into our, um, our boiler feed water system and manage it in the liquid phase. Um, so uh, this is kind of a, a steam trap that is performing well. We've got um, uh, you know, a, a cooler side and a hotter side uh, to where we've, where we've converted that steam into water and we're uh, managing it as, as such. Um, you know, systems that have uh, kind of both phases in the steam trap are areas where you know, something's going on with that, that steam trap itself where it's not performing uh, effectively, either the orifice plate's damaged or, um, you know, and steam traps are those areas where, from a maintenance standpoint, they're a pain in the neck. It depends on your process. Some processes have a lot of steam traps inherently component to them. These are usually found after the end user, so after the heat exchanger or after, um, uh, you know, a piece of equipment that's using uh, the steam. And so, you know, we're, we're taking that steam and driving it back into the condensate system. And, um, you know, the thermal imaging kind of helps identify those steam traps that are working properly and those that, that aren't and are blowing through steam through the system. Um, boiler blowdown. So this is another uh, area where this is kind of, we've talked about uh, a little bit with the boiler itself and that, you know, the mud drum or, and, and trying to blow down um, any sort of uh, contaminants from the system. So as we're circulating water, we're, re you know, in a, th in a very closed loop, very efficient um, boiler system. We're making steam, we're condensing the steam in the process, we're coming back and putting it back in the boiler and we're trying to reuse it multiple times and we're adding makeup to that, uh, makeup water to that system, but we're concentrating impurities and, and salts and other things as that boiler, as that water circulates and is being used. And um, just like any closed loop system, there's a periodic amount of blowdown that needs to happen to you know, clear out those impurities and um, uh, you know, continue this, uh, the, the good operation of the system. Um, you can blow a boiler down too much and you can blow a boiler down not enough. So it's um, looking at that blowdown system and how, um, how that water is being uh, you know, handled and, you know, what those timing is on the blowdown is a part of, of the energy assessment. You know, most systems, larger systems, there's a lot of water chemistry analysis being done in the boiler system. The boiler operators are taking samples and uh, monitoring the, the blowdown. There's uh, anti-scalants and ac oxygen scavengers, chemistry uh, being utilized to maintain these systems. And, and typically there's, um, you know, uh, the chemical vendors do a nice job of trying to help analyze that flow down and that uh, water treatment scheme and making sure that that, that system's being uh, operated properly. You know, during an energy assessment, you know, that is one of those maintenance and operational procedures or practices that, um, that is, you know, should be reviewed and looked at and how, how that system's being managed. And um, uh, anyhow, so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the boiler blow down um, as we're blowing down that hot uh, boiler uh, water, we've lost, we're losing energy from the system. So, um, you know, minimizing that and, and uh, you know, having a good handle on you know, making sure that that's effective is, a, is an important part of the energy assessment. Um, soot blowing. So this is another one that specifically uh, talks about in the, in the uh, I guess, the rule being able to look at these systems. Um, you know, soot blowers are, are basically, um, uh, you know, a high pressure jet of, of, uh, of air that's directed to clean off any sort of debris or soot that's accumulating on, um, on the face of the tubes or the furnace. So being able to uh, clean those surfaces uh, real time while the boiler is running to uh, ensure that the right heat exchange or uh, heat transfer is occurring between the tubes and the hot uh, fire, firebox temperature, um, you know, the, periodically re removing that soot. Uh, you know, most boilers are equipped with uh, some sort of soot blower um, to, to handle that. And, you know, soot blowing is it's a fr frequency that, um, you know, that is, uh, s you know, scheduled or set in the boiler controls on how often the boiler will blow down. 
or blow, uh, the soot blower will come on. And, um, you know, it's, it's dependent on, you know, how clean the, st uh, the gas is, you know, natural gas boilers, it's not really an issue. See this more with uh, large solid fuel boilers that generate a lot more particulate matter that can coat the, um, you know, especially in the upper in the furnace, uh, some of the tubes and, and things there. Uh, what's that? It's a repeat slide. It's a repeat slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Uh, okay, so yeah, is there any regulatory operation to do anything with uh, the findings? Oh, yeah, we've already looked at that one, so yeah. All right, so that was kind of the, I guess, looking at the combustion basics and from an energy assessment standpoint, you know, the different components that, um, of the system that, that are involved and um, uh, kind of a part of the assessment. That, uh, Neil, do you have anything to add, or? Not really. All right, so um, we're yeah, about 20 minutes ahead of the break time, right? So we got a break at 3 o'clock. Um, yeah, if we don't have any other questions, you guys just want to go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back at 3.30, and uh, after the break, we're going to go through uh, the boiler tune-up component, and Neil's got some show and tell on that, and. Um, We'll kind of talk through some of the uh, field experience and things on the, on the tune-up requirements. This is going to cover some of the tune-up requirements. And again, this is a reminder. So uh, like this energy assessment, the initial tune-ups have to be done by that January 31st, 2016 deadline. And then I'll go through some of the requirements of like what, how often they need to be done, um, some of the things that we've done on these assessments, and what needs to be uh, looked at when we're doing the tune-ups kind of in the field as well. Um, so yeah. So look at, looking at things for uh, tune-up requirements, and this is some things from 5D, kind of a table that John put together. It's looking at um, your combustion requirements, like you reduce your stack losses, things we talked about before earlier today, reduce your excess air, um, all kinds of things to improve your efficiency, your, your heat transfer, um, and your waste heat. And all these can be done very simple things, like reduce your flue gas temperature, reduce your stack O2. Um, and those are the two, two of the biggest things we look at in terms of actual combustion efficiency, looking at the uh, efficiency of the actual burners themselves, um, uh, recovering waste heat, looking at things like economizers, pre, uh, boiler feed water preheaters, things like that. Um, anything where you can return your uh, your your waste heat out of your stack. Any, and all these things are great things to look at for in terms of combustion to to make your your units more efficient. Um, if you're looking at steam, your distribution systems and your steam production. Uh, things we talked about earlier. Reducing or limiting losses, looking at your steam traps, looking at your um, basically any any leaks you have, any things that can increase your insulation on your steam, recovering your waste heat, uh, optimizing demand. So basically, just finding places to recover that blowdown steam, um, having economizers, etc. And then just general process efficiencies, um, re replacing older units, um, making things more efficient downstream, etc. So these are just a general things we're looking at, the tune-ups. Um, again, things we've all talked about today already in terms of ways to make your, uh, your whole energy use system a, a better and more efficient uh, system on the whole. Um, so again, uh, tune-ups required initially for all boilers and heaters, every single one. This is not the 20% or the 33% that we talked about for the EAs. Every single unit uh, needs to be tuned initially. Uh, every existing unit needs to be tuned initially uh, prior to the uh, January 31st, 2016 deadline, and then continue to do that annually for any unit over uh, 10 MVTU per hour in your, on your rating there. So that's going to be a lot. Most of your units are going to be required annual tuning. Um, every, if, it's a, if it has an O2 trim system in place, uh, which, they automate, which that makes it every five years, and we've seen that on some units, but a lot of most of the uh, boilers and heaters Heaters especially we've seen have been manual dampers, and so those are all required, the annual tune-ups. Um, and again, it's biennially for smaller units uh, for between 5 and 10 MBTU per hour, and then every five years for heaters that are less than 5 MBTU per hour. Um, and we have some good links here. Again, we said we'll send the, these out uh, via PDF later, have some good EPA reference materials for, uh, for these deadlines and requirements. 
Um, so yeah, what, what's involved with the tune-up? So as, as again, all this is as applicable, but uh, look at the actual burners themselves. Um, but like uh, the pictures that uh, uh, we showed earlier, we had the pictures of the actual burners and the flame patterns. Uh, we had the good, uh, the blue, bright blue flames going in a kind of small, not, not long and orange, like we showed in those pictures earlier uh, during the actual, during the earlier um, presentations. We can look at those later. Um, we'll look at the flame patterns, look and adjust the burners necessary to optimize that uh, going forward. Um, and then inspect the system, controlling the air to fuel. Okay, we mentioned air to fuel ratio is a big, big deal in terms of efficiency and whatnot. So looking at the system, um, your your air registers, your dampers, um, making adjustments as needed. Um, if there's anything automated, make the uh, look at how that's being um, managed and whatnot, and just make sure everything's correctly calibrated and functioning. And then what you're going to be doing is kind of playing with system to try and optimize your emissions of, uh, of CO, consistent with the manufacturer specifications, and then looking at any, if you have any NOx requirements on your, your overall system, uh, trying to make sure you're, keep, you're optimizing your CO while at the same time not blowing by any of your NOx requirements, um, all the while trying to keep efficiency in mind. Um, so again, we use some of the same tools we have uh, for the energy assessments for these tune-ups. Uh, we mentioned the this combustion analyzer, again, you're measuring CO and oxygen. This is, CO actually is, plays a, a bigger role in the tune-ups than it does in the energy assessments in terms of what we're monitoring for um, when we're up on the stack. Uh, monitoring CO and oxygen before and after and any adjustments made along the way uh, with, your, with your air registers or your dampers. Uh, and usually what we're finding is that, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the, the heaters are tuned, or when we go with the initial energy assessments, they're, they're currently operating at high, high O2. So you're trying to try and ramp that down a little bit if we can, while still being uh, safe and still keeping within your NOx and CO limits. On, uh, and so we will usually start closing the dampers a little bit and doing little inc incremental changes here and there and seeing how the incre incremental effect. And again, this process, because you're doing it, trying to do it slowly and safely, um, you do, maybe takes anywhere from uh, one and a half to three hours, four hours tops uh, to do it per heater. So you want to do this and make sure you're, you're monitoring and taking the right um, measurements there and making sure you're doing everything in a safe manner. Um, and then after, you're, after you do the tuning and tuning it down, you're going to have the, your before and after, your, your CO and out, uh, oxygen measured. And generally, we'll do, it, we'll do it high fire or typical operating load. And then maybe we'll do, depending on if, if you have swing loads or not, we can do it at lo lower medium loads as well as high load and kind of do your, your tuning at different load conditions over the, with your, your heater or your boiler. Um, and then the report's going to have uh, the CO and oxygen measurements as well as any description of any corrective actions taken, like what, what actually we did to, to tune the, the heater itself. And then uh, one thing also to do, is because these are done every year, um, you need to have records of your type and fuel use over the prior 12 months. And what one big requirement of the of the regulation is that when you're actually doing the tuning, you need to be firing like you would do most of the time during the course of your previous 12 months. So you need to make sure that when you're actually doing the tune-ups, that it's it's representative of what you how you've been operating the heater for the last year when you're doing your annual tune-ups. So one of the big thing, questions that come up, and we had this discussion I think with somebody over lunch, is that um, sometimes there's confusion about whether the boiler heater should be operational or non-operational when you're doing it. Because one of the big things that, that the, the requirement says is inspect the burner and clean and replace any components as necessary. Um, well, some people think some, there's a bit of confusion about whether the fact that means that you're looking at the actual burners when the, thi when the, um, uh, when the heater or boiler is not firing. Because uh, you can kind of actually get in, inside the heater or boiler and look at the burners that way. Well, actually, we would, and then you need, we prefer, and uh, I think the regulation would like that you have it while it's operational, because you can actually tell a lot more about the, the burner when the flame is actually going on. Like we showed earlier in those pictures, we have a good uh, blue flame, kind of short, not too long, um, that kind of is showing good combustion and not too, uh, not too much O2 versus a long orange flame. And that's, you, you're looking at the flame, and also not just how long it is, but whether, whether the flame is bent over. That way, that could indicate that you're, um, you have some buildup on your heater, on your burners there, as well as uh, just looking at the actual burners and just so one of the things is 
making sure that it is up and running. Um, one thing that we a question we had discussed at lunch was that uh, sometimes heaters will have um, maybe not all of their burners going at a given time because maybe the operators know that one or two burners is not running optimally and they'll just shut it off and run the rest of them. Well, they still need to be looked at and uh, inspected and so those can be, uh, e even though they're not really fired, they need to be looked at at some point. And I think the question, we discussed this, was that we need, you need to actually look at that over the course, maybe during your shutdown, even though you're not firing it, uh, include that in a, in a report in some fashion. You can't just, it might come, up, come to a point where you need to fire that heater at a higher load and make sure that all those burners are running as efficiently as possible and fix them as, as need be to tune your, current, tune your instrument. Um, so yeah, and a lot of times, um, a lot of the burner manufacturers will actually uh, offer, or be, you can bring them in to do a tune-up on the heaters themselves. And I know that John Zink, Zico, um, Calidus will all do this. The problem we found with some of these is that they don't necessarily they do it by their own standards, don't necessarily um, always do it per the, what's required of the, in the 5D regulation. One of the big things that the, uh, we need to make sure you have in that report is, again, the the before and after O2 and the CO measurements um, that we take uh, at, at the stack. Um, so you need to make sure you have your before and after your combustion emissions. And then often we need to, again, we're trying to optimize CO while you're doing this tuning. Um, but also important to know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of cases uh, NOx does trump CO because you have a lot of specific units will have NOx emissions requirements. You need to be able to uh, you should, you should not be optimized to lower CO at the expense of NOx. I know that one of the uh, recent one we looked at, a uh, particular unit had uh, a NOx uh, pound square BTU requirement, and actually we were f fortunate that we were able to lower this, the O2. Uh, the OX actually stayed about the same the entire way down, and so by lowering the O2, it helped them on the pound square BTU level because the way that that's calculated. Um, and I know that that's that's a common thing we've seen is that we'll we'll see that. We reduce that O2, it helps the NOx, and we, do, we get it to a point where you don't start increasing the CO too much. You find that sweet spot where you have the CO and the NOx curves kind of coming together and hopefully getting that uh, the, together uh, optimized in parallel. Um, so again, with regard to the annual tune-ups, they have, uh, once you do one, you have a 13th month window to have the next one completed. So it's annual plus a little bit of wiggle room, but obviously they want you to do it annually to uh, keep them on the ones that are part of the annuals. Obviously, you have that same window for every two years, every, every five years um, for your smaller units. But again, the, we are focusing, I guess, on the annual tune-ups because those are going to be the most common ones we see. Um, and again, need to be completed at high fire conditions or typical operating conditions. So you need to be firing it with the fuel that you had um, used for most of the year at the condition that was most common throughout the, most of the year. Um, so we, again, and again if, we, if we have the opportunity, we'll try during the course of a tune-up, if you have the capability at a given, at a given unit to operate both at me low, medium, or high load while, while we're there, we'll tune at both levels and give you a, a kind of a, a good operating schedule for both. We've done that in some units where we had, they do some swing loads and kind of get an idea of where to set your, your dampers or your registers um, at different lo loads because they'll go between some of the, um, we were talking about this with batch processes, and I know we've done this at a, at a um, paper mill. We did, we kind of gave a curve for over the course of their load, their load cycle where they can set their, their dampers. And they, they did, the hard part with that is obviously you're gonna be jumping around some, you can't necessarily adjust all the time, but they, did so, they do have some predictability in terms of it's gonna be high right now, it's gonna be low right now. So there is some, we can do that as well for them. Now, a lot of you facilities you're gonna have, it's, and set it and it's going to go at about whatever load it's going to be at. So we'll, we, we can work with uh, who, who you're, whoever you are to um, figure out what load is most representative you're going to see over the course of a year. Um, and again, uh, you, can, you can set your student schedule around your turnaround and shutdown schedules and basically, if, obviously, if you have that 13-month window to complete your, uh, uh, your annual tune-up, so if you're going to have it shut down in 12 months, well, you can do it a month earlier or a month later. Just make sure you get it done within that window. Um, so again, what are we doing when we're at a doing conducting a tune-up? Um, and generally, we have for these. I've I've been on the ones I've been on. It's been a two-man team. You usually have uh, my first one out there was John Joyce down on the bottom and me climbing the stack up here, making sure you had your uh, your 
um, your Testo, again, it measures your O2, your SAC temperature, your CO, your NOx, all of that stuff, um, your unburned hydrocarbons. All of those are being test put in the stack wherever um, we can get a port that we can sample from. And then on the bottom, John is meshing, was measuring, was to basically playing with the dampers on here and then kind of ramping it down, getting the, uh, the dampers and the air registers a little more closed and trying to get that oxygen. Usually, again, we saw anywhere from up to around 9 to 10% down. If we can get it down to around 3 to 4% O2 is what we're trying to shoot for in most cases. Obviously, there's um, some heaters may not go that low because you may get your registers too far closed. You don't want to have them completely closed. That's going to be give you a little wiggle room in case there's any upsets. But two in those best we can. Um, taking thermal images of the burners as well as inspecting the flame itself for that orange versus your blue-green flame color. Um, and so those are the big, the big things we're doing while we're doing this and just all the while recording a bunch of data to make sure that you have the good, accurate data for before and after you make the adjustments. And again, we're doing this at every unit. Um, I know that we've been to some facilities, we've just done the energy assessment for them, and we were looking around as part of the 20% for units that actually could we could actually try and sample for. And the problem was that they, we didn't do them for the assessment because they didn't have any accessible ports on their stacks. And that's going to be a problem for them going forward in the sense that if they have to do the tune-ups, where are they going to put, have their sampling point? And so that's going to, we're going to have to, um, like going forward, they're going to have to figure out a way to maybe put a small flange on the stack themselves before they can, so they can do the tune-ups every year. So they have to do this uh, for their heaters because they're all over 10 MBTU per hour. Um, and we've seen that. I know that we have that coming up with a couple um, smaller facilities that just, they have to do the tune-ups themselves. And I, I know that um, my colleague, John Bacon, is thinking about having to bring a small, like just to, to drill a small one-inch port on these stacks because they don't have anything currently where we can sample to do the, to do the proper testing for them. Um, so it's one of those things that, especially some of the older heaters, you'll find that they may or may not necessarily be equipped to have an accessible, safe, a safe accessible port up there, but they will um, have to be tested in some fashion because uh, it's their annual requirement. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, we've had that problem. I, I know. Um, so I, I know there's one facility we were at recently that I had to go back and redo their their tuning because, well, they we were at, going back there anyways because we we went there for the first time. They didn't have all their heaters up and running. So they only they well, some of them only operate intermittently for their uses. But they what they had told me is that they were running, but they were actually we tuned it apparently during the ramp up period, not during the full load. And so when they got to full load, set off low O2 alarms, they basically ran it back down. So we had to tune it again at the high load. Um, this, yes, there is the problem that you tune it. And in theory, yes, you're going to have it set for this. But yes, I know that operations will go and ramp it back sometimes. Um, with regard to a regulatory standpoint on that, I'm, I need to talk to John about that. We've had that issue. I, I've, but I'm, it, the theory is that if you tune it and keep it tuned, it'll work well, but you're not always going to see that. And I, I, under, I recognize that, and we recognize that. You only did exactly.
what happens if you do them more often or the rules are twice? Should we be obligating ourselves to document everything that the rule requires uh, when we do those? Because I know that I actually, I, we've, I've talked about this with John. I think that, um, well, one thing also in addition to that is I know that some places, especially where you have a wide swing in temperature, like you're going to want to tune for summer versus tune for in the winters, you have a high humidity difference there, especially. Um, and that's going to affect your, how much you're going to want to have your dampers open. But I think um, as long as you're satisfying the once per year tuning thing, then I think that if you do it the annual, um, with the, with all the requirements of the regulation, don't quote me on that. I need to double check and I can get back and email you on that. But that's that's my sense for it at this point. Go ahead. Absolutely, I know that that's one thing that we're we're doing as well. We're starting to do more of is that we'll go on site, especially for facilities that have 20, 30 units. Um, they don't necessarily want to pay a consultant to do all of those for them. We'll go on site for a week or a couple of days, and while we're out there, make sure we have operations with us to go and learn what we're doing, see what we're doing, and be able to do those tune-ups as well um, to train them and have the people um, able to do this and understanding why we're doing it as well, and then what the consequences are for not, I guess, leaving it as that, and trying to make sure we can get the, the cost savings opportunities going forward we're talking about. And that's the hard, I've definitely talked about that. It's hard, like, especially if you have the swings in that. Like, what, at what point are you, when you go out there for the tune ups, what fuel load do you have now? What are you optimizing for at this point? You're going to have that. Anytime you have that swing, it's, it makes it a little more difficult. So, um, there, that is one thing that I know that is difficult about this portion of the regulation, but it, it is a requirement. And just as best we can, try and tune them, I guess, during the most representative period. <laughs> But that's always that's not necessarily even predictable. So, I mean, that's the thing I was talking about, like having to go out for a second round at a given facility because they we went out there and one of their two of their heaters weren't running when they needed to be. So we had to go back there and do spend more spend more money doing it. So.
other questions here? Okay. So again, um, we're talking, this is again, we're part of what we, we have the before and after, and then if we have uh, our O2 curve and our CO curve trying to optimize um, your, that point, that point where you have your optimize your efficiency and your, uh, your CO there, and again, by monitoring mostly O2 and, and CO in the stack, as you swing your, as you mess with your dampers and your, uh, your registers there to try and figure out where um, the best operating point is. And again, this, at the time that we tune it, again, if we have the swings and in, in fuel quality, then that's going to necessarily, necessarily be the best overall, but trying to find the best we can um, per, per the purposes of the regulation. Um, so again, and again, with the purposes of the, with the heater, keep in mind that a lot, at this point, so many burners are, are low knox or ultra low knox. And so um, with regard to the, the air going through that, that affects how you're going to have your registers going. You need to have, make sure that those are operating properly for the purposes of your low knox burners, because that's a requirement for a lot of knox standards, making sure that you're, you're operating these in, a, in the proper capacity to uh, have the ultra knox uh, the low knox, ultra low knox burners run in the proper fashion. Um, and one of the big things also is making sure that when you're inspecting the actual burners themselves, you they're they're looking fine and they're they're operating properly and you're they're maintained and cleaned out when as necessary and nothing's building up on them to interrupt either the flame quality or the combustion quality or the impact of the of the low knox burners. Um, and anyway, again, every every burner is different. Um, as we said, as the example we had earlier, sometimes you'll have burners that are conditioned to each other. That one's not running because its quality is bad. They, they shut it down, or like they're not going to have. Um, even if they're identical going in, they're going to be built up in terms of their crud building up on them, et cetera, at different different rates and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to have making sure that as, as best you can optimize each burner um, and keep and expect each one as part of the tune-up. Uh, and do what you can to, during your shutdowns to clean them off, et cetera, as need be. Um, and, and then your, again, your, your burner manufacturers, your Zcos, your John Zinks, your, uh, your Calidus, they can come out and help with this as well, but make sure that when you're doing the, for the for purpose of the tuning report, you have all the requirements in there per 5D. Um, so yeah, um, this, the energy assessments are one-time obligation. Uh, that's again, we included I don't know why that's there. Um, January 31st, 2016, to comply with a uh, 5D regulation. Um, I guess there the logic and I guess the tune-ups are required annually for the for the heaters and boilers over 10 milliamp mb2 per hour. Um, uh, if you install an O2 trim system, you can actually on your on your heaters, you can actually allow the tune-ups to be extended every five years. That'll give you some. Um, and so a big thing with all of this is making sure you have proper documentation for everything. And I mean, none of this has to be submitted. All of this has to be kept on site, whether it's the EAs, your tune-ups, that all needs to be uh, 
make sure you have proper documentation for all of it and you have your certified energy assessor sign off on it, all that kind of stuff to make sure you have all, all of your, um, your, your uh, cost of analysis for your EAs, all of your, um, your, your CO before and after your tuning, all of that data needs to be there and make sure it's all properly documented. And then, um, well, they're here, it'll become part of your Title V permit structure and part of your semi-annual annual reporting. So I'm not, I'm less clear on that, yeah, less clear on that part. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, all the things that are recurring, yeah. Well, so, I mean, how often are you firing that? We can fire it in any, but they, they have two boards. Okay. The, the production is running to create the waste out of it. It's either burning both or one or the other. So we're not always burning it. Okay. So yeah, I think there's a multiple different scenarios. Right. And that's in that case yeah. try to find that average scenario mm -hmm. where the one most the Yeah, the one that's most often used over the course of the twelve years. Um or sorry, twelve months. Twelve months. <laughs> um so in that case you'd have to probably look at your fuel records and see what how often am I am I running it with a 
the hydrogen there. And then, I mean, you, if you wanted to, you could also, I mean, try and well, do it at both scenarios, but then that would involve changing your, if, if it's two very different um, set arrangements, uh, setting it up for both. But I think what the, in terms of the purposes of the requirement, they want you to do it whichever scenario is most common over the course of your 12-month period. I understand your question.
mean, I like to say is that I mean, I think this discussion really is down to this one size fits all rule is hard to apply in every different scenario. Um, so I think that you know, it you know works well for traditional boiler sub burners those kind of process heaters where especially when you have a consistent fuel content, fuel heating value. Yes, I did the annual two up and here's my documentation. You know, that's that's really, you know, you've met the requirement, tested it at what you determined to be the normal operating scenarios. You know, I think it, it wouldn't go any further than that. But from a practical standpoint, it gets the value out of making sure that, you know, I brought somebody in and looked at this, you're doing this up. over time, like the internal dampers and things, one half of those butterfly dampers, you know, just failed or... So, so where do you catch that data? Well, I do my annual tune up, and I report all this stuff. Then you have another piece of it, which is the outage piece, where I do check it, and I check it all the time. Where do you collect that data? Where do you store it? Yeah. Where do you store it? It's probably with the annual tune up. It's not the annual tune up, but it's, it's the uh, normal maintenance activity or the... It's required by that. up once you start it back up or would you um, do, do this this could be any time in that process. Um, The, the boiler tune up, we call it an annual tune up for a specific event. And during that event, like they, were, they normally do it when the unit is operating, you're adjusting the, the airflow, you're getting those measurements, you know, like those, those other inspection items where you're going in and, and doing an internal inspection of it. I mean, in theory, you've already satisfied your burner inspection requirements for the rule when you did your annual.
you'd have to go back and redo the other components of the tune-up. But if you, there were things that you weren't able to get to during the normal annual tune-up, the unit shut down, and now you're able to go inspect those, and that needs to be documented, you know, that inspection um, component to it. You know? so, I, so I think you have to generate a second record for that particular event. But then that wouldn't, that wouldn't set the new 12 months cycle. Have any other uh, final questions, comments, discussion we wanted to have? I mean, we've had a pretty good discussion here at the end, but.